I, am I on? Although the mic is on. I don't know if I'm on or not. But <laughs> All right, are you as nervous this morning as I am? <laughs> I hope you're not. Uh, I can't help it. I have to drink some water from time to time because my throat will get dry. My mouth will get dry. All right, so if you have your Bibles, if you'll open them to Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans is one of the greatest, well, it's the longest letter Paul wrote, and I think it's the most amazing um, presentation of the gospel that you're going to find, explanation of it. Um, and in the first seven chapters, he's talking about the gospel. And then he gets to chapter 8 here. And he gives us this great message. This is like the pinnacle of this whole Romans letter. Verse 1 of Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for this letter that you had Paul write to the Romans and I thank you Lord for this chapter 8 which is so powerful I thank you Lord that there isn't therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus God I pray that we can grasp that fully and that we can learn to live as if we've been forgiven uh, God I pray that you guard my tongue to say nothing contrary to your word but that it will be loosened to say everything that you would have me say on this subject this morning. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit goes before me and before my voice and that it will change hearts this morning. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, are you living forgiven? Are you living forgiven? You say, God, what does that mean? Well, let me give you a little bit of an example of somebody who was living that was not living forgiven. Are you familiar with the name Bart Millard? Does it sound kind of familiar? Mercy Me. He's the lead singer of Mercy Me. And the song, I can only imagine, Bart Millard wrote. And until he wrote that song, he had been struggling to do what God had gifted him to do. He was fighting to be the best that he could be with his band and he was pushing and pushing and nothing seemed to fall. He couldn't get the break that he felt like he really needed to have. And if you watch the movie about him, he is told by his manager, what are you running from? And he said, my father. He said, then write about that. Now it turns out that Bart's father had been an alcoholic from the time before Bart was born probably, but finally Bart's mother had too much and she left. She left her father, her husband, his father. And he ended up living with his dad and his dad crushed his dreams of doing what he thought he was supposed to, which was to be a singer. His dad said, you're going to ruin your whole life chasing a dream, a stupid dream. Well, he finally ran away from home and tried to do what he felt like God was wanting him to do. He had come to the Lord as a youth at camp. And he felt this is what God wanted him to do. But he struggled to make it happen. But he wasn't living forgiven. He still had this thing in his heart towards his dad where he was unforgiving towards his dad. But he never truly felt the forgiveness from God, I think. Until he came home, spent time with his dad, and realized that his dad had come to the Lord because he heard his son sing on the radio just before Bart left. Amazing, amazing movie. If you haven't seen it, get it. It might even be in the library. I'm not sure. I think it was at one time. But All right, so Paul starts this out with, there's therefore now, and you know what a therefore is there for, right? You have to figure that out. What was it there for? That's those seven chapters of Romans 
where Paul lays out the gospel, and it's not just for the Jews, it's also for the Gentiles, for us. Praise God, right? And so he's laid all this out in seven chapters. And then because of what Jesus Christ has done, there is therefore now no condemnation. Well, what's this condemnation that he's talking about? I, I looked up in the uh, Webster's uh, Merriam Dictionary, and, or Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and it says, the act of condemning or state of being condemned, like the condemnation of a prisoner or even the condemnation of a building. So condemnation, then, is being condemned. Have you ever been in a courtroom when somebody was convicted and condemned to punishment because of that conviction? Well, there is a law in the Old Testament that God handed down for his people to follow. And if you do not follow the law, there is a consequence for that. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've kept God's law perfectly because I know the answer to that. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says... All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 6.23, it says, The wages of sin is death. So because of your sin, you deserve to die. But it doesn't end there. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, And just as it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that comes judgment. So if you think, well, I'll die someday and I won't get away, I'll get away from all this problem with God. No, that's when problems are really going to start for you. Because you're going to stand before God. And God is going to say, why did you do? And he'll list those things probably that you have done. And you will not have an excuse. Because he has told you in his word, do not do these things. So how are we supposed to deal with this, this sin problem we have in our life? Because we cannot stand before a just God and say, well, I'm good enough to get into heaven. We might tell people here on earth, I'm just as good as anybody that goes to First Baptist Church. It doesn't matter. You have to be as good as Jesus Christ was when he walked the face of the earth, and he never sinned. Okay, so... Um, how does man deal with that? Well, God gave man a way to deal with that in the Old Testament. In Leviticus chapter 4, I'm going to read this to you. It's, it's a little bit lengthy, but I want you to understand what is happening because it was called animal sacrifice. Blood has to be shed because of sin. Your blood is supposed to be shed because of your sin. But God allowed for a period of time for blood of an animal to cover your sin. So in Luke, or sorry, Leviticus chapter 4, first 12 verses, here's how that was done. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, if anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about things not to be done, and does any one of them, if it is appointed, if it is the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, then he shall offer the sin for the sin that he has committed, a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the entrance of the tent meeting before the Lord and lay his hands on the head of the bull and kill the bull before the Lord. And the, appointed, the anointed priest shall take some of the blood of the bull and pour it into um, the tent of meeting. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle part of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrance incense before the Lord, that is, in the tent of meeting. And all the rest of the blood of the bull he shall pour out at the base of the altar of the burnt offering that is at the entrance of the tent of the meeting. And all the fat of the bull, of the sin offering, he shall remove it, uh, the fat that covers the entrails and 
uh, all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and the loins and the lobe of the liver, the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys and the priest shall burn them on the altar of burnt offering. And the rest of the stuff is supposed to be carried out and thrown into a pile and burned outside of the camp. That's the way sin was dealt with. Every year, you would have to bring your sin offering to the temple for you and your family. And if you're the head of the family, the man, it might be a bull or maybe it would be a, a uh, sheep or a goat or it might be if you're poor, a dove or a pigeon or something or even an offering of grain, depending on how much wealth you had. But you had to bring that, and you had to put your hands on the top of that animal and say, my sins are now on the head of this animal. And then that animal was killed, and the blood was caught, and that blood, which was being shed because of your sins, was then sprinkled before the tent of meeting, on the horns of the altar, and then the rest of it was poured out of the base of the altar there. That's how people dealt with that. Every year, you would have to go again to Jerusalem, make that pilgrimage, and take your animal, and hope that it doesn't get injured on the way, so that you can have a perfect sacrifice that you can give to the Lord that would take your sin on its head and then be killed because of your sin for the past year. So that was a way that they dealt with it. And in, in Romans chapter 8 again, in verse 3, we see, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Well, what was it that the law could not do? So we have laws today, and the laws are there to guide our behavior, Right? So let's pick on a law that maybe some of you have not followed perfectly. Any of you ever go faster than the speed limit that's posted? <laughs> I've done that. Now we have a Garmin, or not Garmin, it's a GPS, not a Garmin, but another type of GPS that's in our car. And when we're traveling, if I get above the speed limit, it has this voice it's a little bit of an annoying voice, a little bit of an authoritative voice. It says something like, you are over the speed limit. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like being told I'm over the speed limit. I know I'm going, I'm going to get there faster <laughs> than the speed limit says I can. But it tells me the law was kind of like that. It reminded us of when we sinned. Now, the law, though, is weakened by the flesh, it says in verse 3 there. How is the law weakened by the flesh? Well, my GPS can tell me you are over the speed limit. But it can't make me slow down. A state trooper can pull me over and give me a ticket. But he can't guarantee that I'm not going to speed again. I heard of a farmer who owned about half of the county and farmed half the county. And he was going through, and they'd hired a new um, uh, police officer in this little town. And as he's going through that town, he's on his way to get a part somewhere for his, his tractor. And he's in a hurry, and speed limit is 30, but he's doing like 50 miles an hour. So that officer pulls him over. Sir, you know how fast you're going? Yeah, I know how fast I'm going. I was going 50 miles an hour, and I'm going to be going faster when I get outside of town. He said, well, the speed limit is 30. He said, I know it's 30. Sir, do you know who I am? And he said, uh, uh, no, sir. He said, well, my name is such and such. Okay. He said, I own half this county. Okay. So he handed him the ticket. He said, you're really going to give me this ticket? He said, yes, sir. You were speeding. He said, then just write out another one because I'm coming back the same way I went through. <laughs> Writing a ticket doesn't guarantee that the person isn't going to do that again, right? Getting a consequence doesn't mean it's not going to happen again. We have that human nature inside of us. Um, 
it is from the time we're little. You ever try to feed an infant something that that infant didn't want? Can you force that child to eat that? No, it's going to keep coming out. It's going to make a mess. It's going to turn his head sideways. You're going to get it on his cheek. That baby is not going to eat what it does not want to eat, right? That's a problem with the heart. And do you ever, when you were a kid, get in trouble like me? And I, I used to fight a lot. I had a terrible temper when I was a kid. And my younger sister and I sometimes would argue and fight. And my dad tried to stop that from happening by telling us, okay, you need to apologize to each other. Say you're sorry and give each other a hug. I did not want to give my sister a hug. And I don't know, but I think she probably didn't want to give me a hug either. <laughs> but we knew we better do that. So we were kind of like, oh, I'm sorry. And tell each other you love you. I love you. You know, <laughs> it wasn't heartfelt. The law, the Old Testament law, cannot make us desire to do things the way God wants to. That was why how the law is weakened by the flesh. Okay, so, so verse 3, uh, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. And he did that by sending his own son, his own son in the likeness of of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. And we'll get to that part of what Jesus did in a minute. But he did that in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. What is the righteous requirement of the law? What does the law require of us? Well, let's see what God's Word says about that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21... <clears throat> it says, for our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the righteousness of God has something to do with being in Christ. In Romans chapter 13, later in this letter, he writes in verses 8 and 9, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one... Who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. You, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the righteous requirement of the law is that we love God and that we love our neighbors. Um, even um, Jesus, in Matthew 22, verses 36 to 39. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he, Jesus, said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the law requires that we love God and we love one another. And many times we're like I was as a child. I might say I love you, but I don't really love you, sister. God wants us to love fully and deeply both him and others. Okay. Okay. Now, when sin was atoned for back in the day, and by the way, atonement means at one meant, or being at one with God. So when sin is atoned for, it means that we can then be one with God. And so it was done through animal sacrifice at one time. But we don't do that anymore. We don't do that because of what Jesus did for us. But I want you to see again what was happening. You bring your animal for sacrifice. <coughs> you place your head on that, or your hand on that animal's head. 
and you let all of your sin pass to that animal. And it would then be either if you're able to stand in that court where they're sacrificed, or if you were not able to, then you would do that, and a priest would lead that animal in. And there were priests standing around, and there were bowls of silver and bowls of gold that were used to catch the blood of the sacrifice. So there are many animals at one time that are being sacrificed. And so that was done three times a day. Those three times were at the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour. Now, they went by sundial time. So the sun comes up. That's the first hour when the sun comes up. The third hour is when it's three hours past sunrise, which would be about 9 o'clock in the morning, our time. Three hours later, it's noon. And three hours later, it is 3 p.m. So every 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m., there was a sacrifice that would happen in the temple. And the priest would be ready to cut the throat of that animal that was being sacrificed. Many priests with their uh, knives, other priests with the bowls to catch the blood, and all that blood would be brought and then would be sprinkled before the tent of meeting as we talked about earlier. Now, how did they know when to do that? Well, there was a priest who would be on the pinnacle of the temple and he would have a shofar which is a ram's horn trumpet and I'm going to have Andy play the sound of that shofar so that you have an idea what that sounds like that was the sound If you were around Jerusalem and you heard that sound, you knew in that moment sacrifice was being made for sin. That was a holy moment in Israel, a holy moment around Jerusalem. And so people would stop wherever they were at and there would be an attitude of prayer because sin is being forgiven in that moment when that Because as soon as that was blown, the priest would cut the throat. Another priest would be catching it in the bowl. And this was happening all in that area of the the tabernacle. And then, or in the temple as it carried over to. And then that would be carried over to a priest who then would begin to sprinkle that blood. And take it in and sprinkle it on the horns of the altar. What a powerful time. But I want you to think about the sacrifice of Jesus for a minute. On that day, he was, of course, beaten, flogged, hardly recognizable as a human being, forced to carry his own cross to the point where he couldn't, and then they had Simon of Serene carry it for him. And they get him to the place where they commit these atrocious acts that they're hoping to keep people in line with, right? Crucifixion. And they put him up on this cross and there's a a thief on either side of him. So it was probably a slow day for crucifixion that day. I've heard that there have been, you know, dozens sometimes of people crucified along that road as people walked by. And as he is there on the cross, it says that darkness fell on the earth from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. So when that shofar went off, it became dark. And it stayed that way for three hours. While Jesus was on the cross. And then Jesus, at his very last word, said, It is finished! In a loud voice. That word, it is finished, in Hebrew is 
to tell us day, to tell us die, to tell us die. It is finished. When the priest was in the temple and he would sacrifice and they would catch the blood, as soon as that was done, he would come out to the people and say in a loud voice, to tell us die. It is finished. And people could then go on about their business again. So you heard the, the trumpet, the shofar sound, and there was darkness for three hours. And then, before that next sacrifice happened, when it was about to, Jesus said, It is finished! And the veil in the temple was torn from the top of it all the way down to the bottom. It wasn't like a man could grab it from the bottom and rip it. This was a heavy, thick curtain. And God tore it from the top to the bottom so that the Holy of Holies was open for anybody to look in. And I think, I don't know this from the Scripture, but I think somehow God had torn that so that blood that was on Jesus' body and falling from his body was carried into the temple, into the Holy of Holies. And that was the last time that it ever needed to happen. Because when Jesus said, the telestai, it is finished, he meant it's no longer necessary to offer animal sacrifices. People no longer have to fight to make things right with God anymore. It's been made right in Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? When we finally understand that, we could be living and forgiven. Unfortunately, we end up too many times walking in the flesh and not walking in the spirit. So, if we read on in Romans chapter 3, verses 8 through 9, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So for all of our human efforts, we can't be good enough to please God, to make ourselves right with Him. We just have to accept that we have been forgiven, that free gift, because of what Jesus did on the cross. His blood was shed for your sin. I think there are many Christians, though, still today that are living, trying to prove themselves to God. And we need to not be doing that. Let me give you an example of two people in Scripture. One who is living by the flesh and one who is living in the Spirit. And this comes from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Um, this is Luke chapter 7, 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked him, asked Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner." Let me just stop for a minute and tell you that if you have those kind of thoughts about God or about Jesus, be careful because he knows your thoughts. 
And Jesus knew this man's, this Pharisee's thoughts. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, and he answered, say it, teacher. He's like, oh, I'm, I've got him in my home, so I've got some prestige. Now he's going to tell me something. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. He said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, which was a thing that they did that day. They washed the feet of the people who were out and came into the house. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not anoint my head with oil, which is another thing that would be done as a greeting. But she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she has loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. He basically said, you love me very little. You've been forgiven very little. And he said to her, to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay. In that situation that happened, with Jesus being invited by this Pharisee because the Pharisee thought, ha, I can look good before God and all these people if I invite this man who's well thought of by the people into my house. But then he has these thoughts, he's not really a prophet because if he's a prophet, he would know this is a sinful woman who's touching him. You know, if you, the Old Testament laws were said if, if somebody is unclean because of sin and they touch you, you become unclean and you don't want to do that. This woman, I believe, had heard Jesus' teachings before. And she had asked forgiveness for her sins, which were great. She may have been a, a prostitute. I suspect that she was. Many scholars think that. She was a sinful, sinful woman. And yet, God had forgiven her. And because she was forgiven so much, she just came in and cried and wiped her feet. How many of you think you would like to do that someday? Go into the house of somebody who has a guest, and for that guest, cry before that person's feet so that your tears wet and you wash their feet with your tears and your hair. <laughs> would you want to do that? What if that person had forgiven your sin debt. That's why this woman was there. She was there to honor him because of what he's done for her. And I tell you that so many times we have things backwards. As Christians, we're trying to please God. We're trying to do everything we can to please God so that he thinks well of us. You can't do anything to make God care any more about you than he already does. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not because of anything we've done, but because of what he's done for us. It's not because of who we are. It's because of who he is. And so we get it backwards. The trick is not to try to be everything he wants you to be out of your doing what he wants you to do. The trick is to do what he wants out of being who he forgave you to be. We have been forgiven. And we need to be living in that forgiveness. We need to be living forgiven. Now, this morning, I'm not sure where your heart is. Maybe, maybe what's been shared here this morning 
has impacted you and you realize that you haven't truly been living forgiven. You've been still trying to prove yourself. I encourage you to get that right before God. You can come down here and pray. Come down, talk with a pastor, talk with me, whatever you feel like you need to do. But I encourage you to get that right so that you can live freely for Jesus. Jesus said that, um, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Living forgiven is living free from that heavy shackle of sin that we've been carrying around our whole lives. And sometimes when we've been coming to the Lord, we give our lives to him, we feel like we still have to drag that sin around with us. When Satan begins to whisper in your ear, yeah, but you know what you've done in your life, and he reminds you of your past, just remind him of his future, all right? Don't let Satan whisper in your ear and slow you down. Why would he want to slow Christians down? Because if we're living free, fully forgiven, we're going to be on fire for the Lord, and he won't be able to stop that fire. So maybe today... You're, you're not a Christian. You can't say that I've given my life to the Lord. Maybe today you need to say, God, I know I have not been what you want me to be. I am a sinner. I need to get that right. You need to come today and say, I give my life to you, Lord. I know I'm a sinner. I ask your forgiveness and help me to live the way I ought to by coming and living in my heart through your spirit. Maybe that's what you need this morning. I don't know what it is, but as um, Elizabeth comes for the hymn of invitation, um, I invite you to come and do... um, Go ahead, Elizabeth, come on. I invite you to come and give your heart and life to Jesus or follow him freely and be living forgiven.